Uh, hi guys, so my name is Nick Herring. I'm the technical director of infrastructure for EVE Online at CCB Games, which is a very long title for Cosmic Plumber. Um, we're gonna be going over kind of EVE Online, uh, the last 20 years of development, what that looks like, what we had to work on to kind of modernize the EVE Online tech stack, at least from the perspective of the server side and the, the network portions of the client side. Um, and we'll go over more of what the topology is and the evolution of that topology, kind of how Eve originally started and how it's gone from, uh, from 2003 to what we have now. And we're gonna talk about how we tried to fundamentally or are fundamentally changing how we actually work on Eve Online. Um, there's multiple pieces to that, but the two biggest ones being a technical aspect and a cultural aspect. Um, and the cultural aspect is a pretty big part of it. Um, and hopefully, uh, we don't have to go too fast here because right after this we have a round table. Um, but the round table is more for anything else. So any kind of Quasar specific stuff we can talk about here, hopefully at the end of this, if there's time for questions. Uh, and then afterwards in the round table we can talk more about other things like Quasar and Easy and how they interact and what makes sense there and, and, the, and any kind of other technology that we're using on the server side. So we can start with 20 years of EVE development. Uh, it was released in 2003, you guys all know this. Um, right now, there are roughly over 2 million change lists in Perforce. Um, that number is probably growing faster and faster as we add more and more automation into the ecosystem. So there's less and less humans actually making changes to the code base. And we've kind of added a little reference of how much code there is. And I've added this uh, silly reference of the UE4s. So if you take the code base of Unreal Engine 4, uh, you can kind of get an idea of, of how much of that code is, is being used there. It means absolutely nothing, it's just fun to think about. Um, <laughs> and so if we think about like the C++, that's where a lot of the rendering code is, that's where the simulation code is, uh, and that's a lot of where the, the, the glue is from uh, C to Python marshalling and back and forth. Um, so that's roughly 1.7 million lines of code. Um, then the next up would be SQL. So a lot of Eve is run by basically SQL procs. A lot of the logic is, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> and so we can see that just our SQL code alone is the size of UE4. Um, and then if we continue on, where a bulk of the logic was written uh, in Python, in stackless Python, um, we can see that there's 3.4 million lines of code a little bit more than a UE4. And then if you weren't worried enough yet, we have roughly 53 million lines of YAML. Um, this is 24 Unreal Engines uh, worth of code. Code's a strong word, but um, <laughs> this, this is what holds everything to do with uh, how the universe is authored, any, anywhere from how the spaceships are made uh, and, and authored as far as the attributes are concerned. And there's a lot of work done there, and, and this, this would have looked a lot differently uh, from probably about three years ago, I think, where we had a team internally that was jamming on moving all of that out of SQL into a binary file system that we could work with and author with. That way we didn't have to deal with things like promoting between databases and instead the files traveled with the actual branch itself. So that's just a little bit of idea of kind of the momentum that is EVE Online and what we have to deal with when we want to make a, a foundational change to how the system works. And so looking at the beginning here, it is deceptively simple. Uh, most of you guys know about this or have seen this in a different form. Uh, we have the concept of soul nodes. Uh, that is part of the monolithic code base that we have. Soul nodes can take on any um, role, as it were. It could be servicing corporation requests, alliance requests, uh, wallet, uh, the actual literal location of the solar system, the simulation within that. So we can swap in and out of those roles and a lot of the orchestration usually happens on the soul node level. Uh, then we also have the proxies, which is kind of dedicated to uh, managing the connections coming into the system. And that's important because ultimately that wasn't the, like, that wasn't the original version of this. And, and we have some other CCPers here who actually just rejoined that were on the original team that worked on this that can probably pick this apart a little bit more. But proxies didn't originally exist. They were built out of necessity. Basically, as soon as people went over 100 people on EVE, they were like, we have to do something about how this connects. Because ultimately, uh, this represents kind of the, the topology of Carbon IO. So everything is, 
is a mesh network, so it's a guaranteed one hop mesh network, which becomes a quadratic problem almost immediately when you're trying to deal with resource management and those kind of things. But it's very powerful in the sense that a lot of how Eve works is about deterministic routing. That's contrary to modern technologies around things like RabbitMQ or Nats or Kafka or those types of things where you have more dynamic routing. Slightly different, but Eve does a lot of things where it knows your character ID, and by virtue of knowing your character ID, it doesn't need to ask the ecosystem where to go. It can make a very educated guess and get to the right node for the right information. And that's very powerful early on. And all of this was kind of tackled around uh, Carbon IO, which is kind of the glue for all of it at this point in time. Uh, and this is a homebrew protocol written in, in Python. So a lot of the networking calls are all pure Python and that's where all the traffic is going and being shaped and those kind of things. Um, and that goes back into the desktop client over the internet and those types of things. Um, another big part of this is the combination of this with, with IO completion ports. And IO completion ports are important in this regard because with stackless Python, stackless Python only does one thing at a time. And it's something that I have to remind every engineer, it can only do one thing at a time. Engineers try to do modern techniques of like distributed locks or mutexes or whatever the case may be, but it doesn't actually matter. Stackless Python only does one thing at a time. The other terrifying part is that it's not only on a single core, it's on a single logical processor. So when we're reinforcing uh, fleet flight nodes, for example, we're basically just trying to throw as much clock speed at that node as possible. It doesn't even actually matter how many cores we put on it. Um, and that's kind of one of the ultimate limiting factors that had us start the conversation about what became the idea behind Quasar and, and how we start teasing that problem apart. Um, but IO completion ports are also important in the sense that it, it, it makes a step towards deferring the management of those sockets from Python. Because the more stuff that we get out of Python, the more one thing at a time that we can do. Um, and so that defers to a kernel and IO completion ports is a, is a nifty trick. Uh, it's similar to um, polling, uh, socket polling in, in Linux, if you're familiar with that. Um, there's a push-pull paradigm asymmetry there. Um, but that's how it works on Windows. Oh, by the way, all of this is on Windows, oh, lol. Um, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, and so as this evolved and, and the Eve players grew and, and more and more things started being built inside of this, is that part of like the Python that we were talking about grew and grew and grew under a nice little folder called script, <laughs> which basically became a large portion of, of, the, of the actual code base. What would end up happening is during releases, um, people started noticing that like forums would go down or web pages would go down. Like I think the Eve wiki at that time would, would go down um, because every release would publish information about the details of Eve. So I think back then we didn't have the SDE and we didn't have any of the APIs. And so the reflex to that was to build the XML API. They're like, hey, this is, this is taking down our web servers and that's bad because when we do releases, we want everybody to see all the new information, everything that we're doing. So they built up the XML APIs to kind of protect from that. And what I, I, have, I haven't really found the exact person or the exact reason this came into existence. That's the original reason for it. But I don't think people realized at that point in time that what they were doing was effectively making one of the biggest retention mechanisms in Eve because it allowed you guys to build on top of that. Then things like Evemon were born, uh, importing things through like EFT and all those kind of things when, when we had all that static data. But ultimately, uh, this was all done XML over HTTP, um, and it was it was basically a, a read cache. Nothing nothing fancy there. And I think if anybody remembers the XML API, the cache timers on that were horrendous. Um, it was I think multiple hours on the actual liveness of the data. Um, and so this got into things like uh, managing skill plans through through Evemon. Um, and, and you can kind of see an echo of that with uh, skill plans in the game right now, which oddly enough is connected to Quasar. So it's serendipitous that one of the first full features that was 100% on Quasar is actually the same third party developed uh, feature that was built outside with the original XML API. And so as this kept growing, we kept adding more and more things to the ecosystem. We started getting OAuth 2 because then we had added a launcher and we needed other websites to federate with other information that might be there. And so, you know, then we started getting OAuth 2 over HTTP and that, that ecosystem started to grow. 
Uh, and I've kind of simplified this so that monolith services kind of represent souls and proxies. That's the, the OG cluster, if you will. All services started growing into a suite of .NET applications um, for managing uh, payment information or various other things. And, and this suite of, uh, of services was actually, technically speaking, the first external service to the original cluster. And so they started dealing with a lot of the problems without understanding or not, they understood it, without really knowing about kind of the paradigm that a lot of people talk about today, when people talk about monoliths to microservices. Like that is a thing that almost everyone has heard something about. At this point in time, only a handful of people knew about this or had completed it, right? The entire world was at in this point in time dealing with this problem and nobody had a name for it yet. And so this was roughly the first cluster of services that we had live outside the actual EVE ecosystem in their own sustained way. And also to note, all of this stayed inside of our data center. So this was still inside of uh, basically metal boxes right next to each other. But the problem with those is, and this is one of the problems with people that in implement with microservices, is that ultimately they're like, yeah, we got a bunch of microservices and they're all connected to the same database. Oh, that's not how that's supposed to work. <laughs> like you've just created another monolith for your database, right? Um, and this is ultimately the trap that they fell in, right? It, 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 that was one of the tricky things. Um, and so as we started looking more into kind of like the surface area of how these things were growing, um, this then came on to introducing Crest. And my history here is a little blurry because I was actually coming into CCP when dust was winding down. Um, but ultimately, Crest was built because of the concept of dust. Ultimately, the, the orbital bombardment was done through a Crest call because that went from the PSN uh, uh, network into our network, and that's what basically coordinated the, the orbital bombardment strikes. Um, the interesting thing about Crest is that it was then trying to adopt mentalities at that point in time. And in this case, it was very, very academic mentalities. This was a hypermedia restful JSON, if anyone remembers what that is. It's basically a self-documenting, self-referencing API. And the idea behind that was that a robot could then navigate the API and do what it wanted to do. <sighs> Humans, unfortunately, were doing that, not robots. Uh, so that became a lot of paperwork just to use the API. And then on top of that, dealing with all the changes and the breakages there, uh, the implementation here got even more interesting. Those, those nodes for Crest were effectively a sole node with more logic on them. And so they were susceptible to the same scaling problems of basically the one hop mesh network and also implemented on top of stackless Python. So it also paved the way for write endpoints. I think Crest is the, I can't remember the first write endpoint. It might have been like autopilot or Eve mail. I can't remember exactly the first one. Uh, but this also paved the way internally for this because this was a big deal. Not many people cared, and I use quotes there because I'm not saying that nobody cared about it, but they weren't really bothered by the fact that people were scraping data and not taking down the server. It sounds great. When we started building up Crest, and like, hey, we're going to allow players to automatically affect things through the API. And then it became an entire civil war internally on like what that meant and how we should go about doing that. Obviously, the cat's out of the bag. But at that point in time, it was more about isolating it to the difference between what we could affect in the universe and what was localized to the player. So that still stays to this day. There's not anything that you can do, even in ESI, where you can affect the universe. It has the illusion of that, but you don't actually affect the universe. Until we introduce things like actually manipulating market calls that affect inventory, then things start affecting the universe. But most everything, if I remember correctly, is about endpoints that can only affect the state of, of your character, like autopilot, contacts, Eve mail. I can't remember all of them. Um, and so this set that precedence there. And this kind of introduced yet another point that we were uh, building on. And so the problem with this growing surface area ultimately became performance like we were talking about. This is all built on top of stackless Python. We could only scale vertically, not really horizontally because the more nodes that we scaled horizontally, the less connections we could deal with upfront, and that became a problem. That, that equation basically didn't work out. I think when we did the math on that originally, that number came to around 100,000. Um, now, we haven't been to that number yet, um, but 
Uh, ultimately, that was the, the proponent of that. Like we, that was the, what was powering those decisions. Um, and this gets into stackless Python. Oh, the gill, right. So Python in general, whether it's stackless or not, doesn't matter, has what they call a global interpreter lock. This is what forces it to do the one thing at a time. But it also makes it very powerful in the sense that you don't have the complications of any concurrency paradigms or primitives that you then have to coordinate. There's no synchronization ultimately because it's only doing one thing at a time. The database was also a problem here. Um, a big part of why we implemented a lot of the tools that we have today uh, is because when we started introducing Easy, it basically became the scapegoat for any problem that came up at any point in time. Um, to the point where I had a tally board in the office of not easy or easy. <laughs> um, and so the database becomes a bottleneck for this because ultimately it's the same problem. We have all of this concurrency happening at a single location that can only scale out to a certain degree. And that's, that's why you read all the, the dev blogs that we have, even the recent one about the hardware upgrades, where we literally have to throw metal at it to solve some of those problems because the complexity or the density of the actual operations being done to the database can only be mitigated by faster light in this case. Maintenance uh, is another big one here. In order to change anything in XML API, that was great because it was a standalone service. We didn't have to worry about tranquility going up or down. However, it had the side effect of if anyone changed anything in the database, the XML API didn't know about it. So there was a lot of thrashing in the sense that endpoints would go down and break, and various other things would mismatch with uh, certain attributes or whatever the case may be. We still have this problem with easy right now in various different places that we're still combating, but in a different way. Um, this gets into deployments. Um, Crest could not be affected unless we changed, like brought down TQ ultimately. Uh, that's one of the other big pieces about what we're modernizing it. Um, uniform criticality. This gets back to what me and CCP Tuxford were talking about in Vegas, and this, this talk is basically a, a status update of the, the talk we had in Vegas, um, where we were talking about the concepts behind this and more the technology that we're using and the developer experience that we're targeting, uh, less about where we're at now and, and ultimately what the cultural changes need to be to achieve that. Um, and uniform criticality in this sense means that everything is priority one. And that's a problem. Hey, email's not working. Well, email could not work to a point where it starts cascading failures inside the cluster. Well, now email is <laughs> definitely priority one, but that's the silliest thing to have as priority one. We would rather just turn off email instead and deal with that problem and then turn it back on when it's ready to go. Oh, unfortunately, Eve's not built in this way. However, our teams have become exceedingly efficient at building and working in this way, but that is an immense slowdown into how they build into what they can build. And then we get into the development aspect of this. Domain boundaries became a huge part of what we started talking about because ultimately, when you start building something on top of a sole node, domain boundaries instantly get blurry. And if I could oversimplify what has happened over the last 20 years with the EVE code base, you combine things with a dynamic language like Python, uh, maybe some of my little personal biases there, you have, the same, you have the same database, you have a single deployment mechanism, and what happens over time is it doesn't matter how well you organize or build the code base. Because that's the, the thing about Eve is all the core components are, are well designed in the sense that they're like what people used to call service-oriented architecture, which is now microservices. We've been doing the same thing since the 70s, everybody just keeps calling it a different thing. <laughs> We found the old guy. <laughs> and so uh, ultimately, it didn't allow you to actually build those boundaries. Everything kind of blurred together, and it became this thread that you had to pull at, which caused all these side effects. These side effects that no one did intentionally, it's just kind of how they happened, because if you can't isolate the domains that you're actually working on, you can't really take responsibility for just that piece. I mean, we can talk about how many different types of mission systems that we have in EVE Online. That's because when you go to look at them, like, I'm going to add this thing, and you look at it and go, nope, I'm not touching that, because it's connected to so many other things. And it's almost always easier to build something in a separate corner, and then some other pieces build on that. Eventually, tentacles come out of it, and everything gets woven together, right? 
And keep in mind, this is over the course of 20 years, right? Like this is not something somebody went, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna connect every domain into a massive monolith. That's not what people were doing. It was, it's much a, a natural evolution of things. And then this gets into data ownership. And this goes back into the database and how the database works. When we have things like hot tables or poorly planned queries, it's because of some other services and what they might be querying about that information. Uh, but that's kind of broken because they shouldn't be sharing that. that. That shouldn't be part of the problem. And data leaking out or being consumed by anything else shouldn't be a problem either. Like, for example, when, we're, when we have the, the auth services, they were actually dipping into the same DB and connecting character information and user information. Well, that meant that anybody that wanted to do anything crazy with characters couldn't because now it would have affected another system that they didn't have any actual agency over. And this is why now you're seeing more and more changes come through, like with what CCP Nomad was saying earlier about like, the skills and what we want to change and affect there. There's, we're, we're trying to make it easier to define those boundaries so that people can make more surgical foundational changes instead of just kind of adding on and trying to sidestep what's already there. And then we get to the cognitive load, which is more about how the developer is working. And this is what I mean by, we've conditioned our engineers to keep all of this in their head when they work on anything. And if any of you have worked at the different, like worked on a project that has automated testing versus doesn't have automated testing, there's a radically different mental experience and motivating factor. If it doesn't have automated testing, I'm not incentivized to make it better. If it does have automated testing, I'm more incentivized to make it better and even make broader sweeping changes. And going back to the millions of lines of code that we talked about earlier, there's a lot of missing automated testing in that. But that's also something that we're working on, right? But it's still to create a system or connect those systems or make them manifest in the, the experience or, or, I regret saying this word, but like illusion of gameplay, right? Because that's what we're kind of getting at, right? We're, we're all living in this wonderful fantasy of flying a spaceship and those kind of things. But to make that really connect, you have to then deal with all of these other pieces when it really should just be, hey, Let's change the way the spaceship flies. Um, so this kind of led us, all of these different pieces kind of led us into what we were talking about with the original idea of Quasar. We didn't, we didn't know we were going to build Quasar, by the way. This was kind of an evolution of, of how things went. Um, ultimately, the origin was the Eve Swagger interface, or the open API implementation. And when we started working on that, the, the vehicle for that was the actual mobile application, uh, the Eve Companion app, or Eve Portal, right? Um, and when Eve Portal came out, it was mostly the fear was that, number one, we had all of these new devices that would come online that weren't necessarily connected to Eve, and it was much easier to connect to all of this, so we needed a way to protect the cluster, which meant we couldn't scale horizontally with Crest because that would eat up resources. And it definitely wasn't going to be an XML API because XML. Um, and so we kind of discovered a way to sidestep decades of technical debt by introducing a message bus. And that's kind of the core piece of, of where Quasar started. And we didn't know this yet. But ultimately, you know, if we look at, you know, going back to talking about Eve's original design, like at the core of it, how it's designed, there's roughly about, if you, if you, so I'm, I'm trying to speak about this in the sense of like a RESTful API, but if you take the core monolith of Eve and try to actually dissect what's going on there, there's roughly about a little over 300 services internally to just the Python code base that's talking to itself. This is roughly 6,000 endpoints compared to the 190 that we have for Easy. And that's just to power everything that you see in the actual Eve client. And that's hard to keep track of when you don't have anything dictating what the domain boundaries are, what the data ownership is. And so that was the big reason why we chose things like Swagger Spec, which eventually became OpenAPI, because we wanted people to be able to have the conversation about what is it that you actually own, what are you building against, what's your contract that you're going to maintain for everyone else. Then ultimately, we got into Kubernetes and the cloud space with this. Um, what ended up happening was we were trying to build things against our data center, against heart, like we, at one point in time, we were like pixie booting machines into IBM Blade Centers and running Cube before V1, 
Um, it worked, it worked, but it was not sustainable, unfortunately. Um, and then we kind of just one clicked into GKE uh, inside of Google Cloud. That's where we kind of started our journey with, with Kubernetes. Um, and that just allowed us to provision resources that we would never have access to, to wield a lot of power that we would never have access to with things like, uh, we wouldn't have to worry about the link speed uh, of what's coming into our data center uh, versus just making a load balancer and everything coming in. We eventually landed on Amazon for various other reasons, but um, that's kind of the journey that took us there. And then ultimately the message bus was the core piece of this. And we chose the message bus over a service, service mesh architecture because of the ideas that we had about how this would evolve. Um, up front, a service mesh is very difficult to get all the right tooling in place to help people debug and maintain, whereas a message bus gives you a bottleneck, which seems counterintuitive in the grand scheme of things, but gives you a dedicated bottleneck to own all of the pieces that are flowing through there and allows your, like, your upfront cost as far as getting other teams on board uh, to go faster sooner. Um, so this is the distinction that we made originally. This is also while the world was still figuring out things like Istio, Linkerd, um, Envoy, Ambassador, all the other cool things that are out there now. Um, and we still, we still talk about this heavily because we're now to the point where we're emulating a service mesh to a degree, um, but we ultimately wanted the teams to not have to worry about what the ingress looked like. We only wanted the teams to worry about their domain and the data that they owned. So how do we make it so that they only care about inputs and outputs? That was our primary goal. This led us to Protobuf. After doing everything in Eve Portal and with ESI, and there's still ESI endpoints that do things through JSON. Sorry, let me be clear. All of you guys see JSON. On the back end, we see some endpoints that are doing Protobuf, and we see some endpoints that are doing JSON. When we started to build and just basically blitz through the easy spec and started building everything, we built it all in JSON. We learned real fast that was gonna be a problem when we didn't have a schema to really deal with wrangling in all the data. And that's kind of why we started looking at things like Protobuf. And we started looking at things like Protobuf to deal with performance as well. Once we realized, oh, Protobuf has this nice uh, C++ uh, mechanism where you can generate native code that can also do the serialization for Protobuf. And what that means is, we're, we're basically moving everything from our do one thing at a time stackless Python of writing down messages and then just throwing that memory at C++ and saying, you do this instead, while Python can go do the next single thing it can do, which is a huge performance benefit for us. Naturally, this led us to gRPC because ultimately when we started doing this, we started connecting to this as a server. Everything was going great. We, this is how we established like a lot of what you're seeing from the data teams, a lot of the newer pipeline around the definitions of those events, what's being basically firehosed out of the system is coming through uh, Protobuf into the message bus ecosystem. But ultimately, when we started talking about this more and more, we realized uh, we need a way to actually connect between these systems. What makes sense there? We didn't want to maintain a protocol for this. There was no point in that. There were so many to pick from. And Protobuf became kind of the, the anchor for this because it was just a hop, skip, and a jump away and we could generate gRPC endpoints. Um, then we realized, oh, we can put this in the client. And that's where the idea of Quasar started. When we realized, wait, we can close the loop on the entire ecosystem and sidestep the entire legacy code base and keep everything inside of Cube, inside of Golang, inside of the message bus, and not have to deal with anything that's going on. I mean, we do have to deal with it all the time. Like, the, It's not all sunshine and rainbows. We still have to go in and make sure things connect and actually manifest in the universe uh, the way they're supposed to. And this then got us into domain services. And uh, I'm, I, I, I really don't like the word microservices, number one, because no one knows what it means. Uh, but also, number two, it defines an arbitrary scope to what you're designing. Um, and this is why we talk about domain services, because it ties it back to the actual data model. Like, what are you actually building and what should you own? An example of this, and one of the first kind of domain services that we built for Eve was Skill Plans. Skill Plans owns everything that it does, and it never touches the monolith at all. Um, other than sending out, by, by proxy of sending out like other events of like, hey, they want to train this skill now from, from the Skill Plans. Um, 
Even that might be debatable. It might be going through the client. Point is, all of that data that you're sharing with your corporation, with all those skill plans, all those different pieces, uh, that's all completely going through Quasar. And we had some other services before that where they're going through Quasar. The activity tracker is another one of them. But it wasn't quite doing the same thing. And we can kind of point that out here. Um, oh, wait a minute. Yes. Um, so this is kind of where we're at now. Those are tiny words. Um, yeah. And so this kind of represents where Quasar is in, in kind of the cloud provider that we have. Uh, we ultimately have a service gateway, which is the first piece of this puzzle, and that is our authoritative domains. This is like if, it, if there's an event inside of this uh, domain, it is a fact of the universe. A ship exploded, uh, this guy bought something on the market, whatever the case may be. And this is what's normally referred to as east-west traffic in the terms of kind of your network topology. Uh, this is usually within owned uh, networks uh, for, that, for that company. Um, and you can kind of see here where we introduced the mobile client and all these other pieces that eventually got pieces of Quasar. It wasn't known as Quasar at that point in time, but it eventually got in. Um, the public gateway then represents our north-south traffic, uh, which is basically anything that egresses or ingresses between controlled networks. So basically, your guys' machine versus our guys' machine. Um, and those we treat radically differently because if we emit, emit an event on the service gateway, it's a fact. If your client emits an event, it needs to be statistically significant. And what I mean by this, like when we're tracking like who, how people use certain things within the client, like opening or closing windows, or whatever the case may be, we can't trust any of that data. It's coming from an untrusted source, and you know, clients get modified every now and then it seems. So we have to take into account like what is true and what is not. So they have to be statistically significant. Um, and this is the part where we started talking about internally, where ultimately the Desktop client isn't the only client. And this started opening the door for how we talk about the future of, uh, of how Eve works and, and what happens and, and what we build. Um, where we started talking about Eve Portal, the websites, the third-party apps that you guys are constantly building. Um, all of those pieces, it, 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 it means that you could play, potentially play Eve um, from more than just the desktop client. So part of this was proprietary to standards. We're talking about things like our original, like, Carbon IO, that proprietary Python um, uh, protocol, going into things like Protobuf, gRPC, those kind of things, over AMQP or Google PubSub or Nats or whatever the case may be. I skipped ahead, that's the message bus one. Um, but that ecosystem is also the big part of this. When we talk about things like what CCP Nomad was talking about with the AR Career Program, right? All of those pieces that we're doing there aren't specifically for the AR Career Program. Right now they are. But all of those extra events, all of those things that are being tracked, those are all pieces that we can reuse within that ecosystem. So the more and more pieces that we have, this is kind of the original uh, ignition of, of the activity tracker. While the activity tracker didn't act on these things, it still tracked all of them. And then it gave us all of this extra information on how to react and, and how to build upon that information that's already been throwing around the, the, uh, the ecosystem. And, and we prototyped these a while back, I think, I think there was even a fan fest where we put up arbitrary data, or not arbitrary data, we put up prototype data on a kill mail system, and then everybody lost their minds over logic in, or logi info on the, uh, on the kill mails. Um, that is also something that we're looking to do and proceed to, but like, that's part of this evolution and part of the performance pieces that we're talking about here. Um, this also gave us a ubiquitous language. This was one of the biggest problems that we had internally. You could build a service or any of those pieces and go to a separate team and then go look at that and go, I can't use that, when they really could, but there was no ubiquitous language to communicate that. So Protobuf gives us that ubiquitous language in the entire ecosystem where we can go and say, hey, I'm going to make a call here, and that service doesn't care who it is or what it's for. It doesn't have to care about something inside of that Python module mutating it to something else or changing something that it shouldn't need to or somebody else deploys a different version of that. Our teams are now building around the concept of you own this API. You need to keep this API working. And if we want to change that, that's a conversation around the actual language and the domain, which then gets us to our domain services, um, which is the piece more around what do you own, what do you iterate on, those kind of things. An example of this is skill plans again, uh, where we, uh, we were talking about modifying how skills work where it's not, no longer a queue, you're dumping skill points into uh, 
Uh, like you're accruing skill points and then you do with those what you want. You don't have to actually plan that out. And the evolution of skill plans might be that it just becomes the domain service for skills. That might be the natural evolution of that. Uh, we've yet to see that because we're still learning these pieces. And again, these are the services that are still kind of the first ones of their kind inside of Quasar. So ultimately, kind of what did we learn from this? It gets into the micro versus domain. Um, and this kind of gets into the delineation bef because like the, the, the biggest problem, like if you think about it abstractly, when you have a game engine involved in anything, that is instantly a monolith. The client for that, for that game is a monolith. There's not much you can do around that. There's a lot of talks around that. You, you hear about uh, micro UIs or micro front ends or those kind of things, and that might be the next evolution of that. We'll see. Um, but this is basically the difference between what we, like we couldn't use any of these technologies in EVE because all of those things were detached. Like if you use Spotify, the little bar at the bottom of it was its own HTTP call that went to a separate service. Whereas in EVE, that connects to the proxy, which goes to the sole nodes, routes over information, goes to the same database and comes back through. Everything was connected, right? And so that's the big difference for us. And we want to concentrate on the domains, uh, not the individual uh, mechanisms. And then learning the difference between a message bus and a service mesh, kind of getting to the nuances of dealing with connectivity, ingress, how players connected, uh, and kind of getting that off the table so our devs could concentrate on other things. And then getting to API, representing the team boundary. Not like I, you know, we, we kind of have evolved from this uh, building features in the sense of I need to build all of these pieces because I need all the pieces of this feature in order to make this thing, which the side effect over that, over time, is you have a lot of things that are very similar and you don't evolve the existing ones. As opposed to, we own the API for characters, do you need more data, need you to change the way that something works, then there's a team that can have a conversation with that and usually that's over a PR over protobuf. And ultimately, new technology is easy, culture is not. And I, and I say that as a relative statement. Like, there's a lot of complex things that we're doing with technology, but the thing that surprised us the most was kind of people's reaction to that new technology. Uh, some people jumped right in, other people it kind of reflected some deficiencies that we had in kind of the processes that we were doing. We're again going back to automated testing, where we were pulling people into the spotlight of like, cool, where's your test? And I'm going, I don't have any. Like, you can't, you have to add those things in this ecosystem. And so evolving that culture to understand like what the progress of those types of things would be. And this is a question I've gotten on different podcasts and streams that I've talked on. Why? Why concentrate on this? Why not build more features? Why not do all of this? Like, this is a holistic approach to how we need to fundamentally fix a lot of different things in the ecosystem. Over time, over 20 years of teams isolating and what the features that they could only need to build and kind of the, the turbulence and natural ups and downs of a, of a company and, and people and people's lives and real life and those kind of things, ultimately we need to fundamentally change how we're working. And in order to do that, we need to change the technology of what we're actually building upon. Because if we need to fundamentally, we need to fundamentally change how Eve works. And we can't do that unless we change how we work. Um, and so Quasar is kind of the fundamental stepping stone uh, that we're using to build more and maintain more of the, the Eve universe. Uh, the end. Thanks. <laughs> do we do questions here? Ha! Ah. <laughs> Couldn't tell if that was somebody who had the authority to say that or not. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. The old guy. <laughs> ah, yeah. Yeah, so the question is like, Nadia, the new graphical editor, uh, that's using to, to build a lot of the content, is it using Quasar? It is not specifically using Quasar because a majority of that is client-side experience mechanisms that's going on, but it is hooked into a lot of the event loops that, that are flying into Quasar. So we, we can observe a lot of what's happening there. And so as that team does more and more, that's kind of outside a unique uh, experience for a single player, because that's ultimately, like so far, the NP is that. Um, once it starts to kind of going outside of that scope, it will probably wander more into our territory as far as what we need to support. 
I wouldn't say blameless. <laughs> no, so I mean, we so we try to do we try to do retros for that, and I would argue that a lot of the the team that works on Quasar and the infrastructure teams in general, um, there are elements of SRE there um, where. Uh, so we do we do rotations on call rotations, but we kind of combine that with like if you're on call, I'm not going to care if you don't get your primary project done. I want you to concentrate on like answering people's questions. Of course, if there's alerts, something melts down, all those kind of things. But if all, if everything is quiet, it's kind of one of those things of what's making the most noise, make it stop making noise. Um, so we we kind of have that SRE mentality in that sense. Um, the other aspect of that is we're big fans of SLOs. Um, and trying to keep track of those things and seeing things before they catch fire. Like being able to see the smoke before the fire is pretty powerful. Um, and that has to do with a lot of the tooling that we've introduced to the ecosystem, not only just Quasar, but the, the original code base of Evo Online with things like uh, Sentry, Honeycomb, Grafana, Prometheus. Uh, there's tons of stuff like that, yeah. No, thankfully not. <laughs> I checked. <laughs> Right, so the, the question is, is what is kind of the forward plan of, of simulation-based services versus non-simulation-based services? Ultimately, this was the original idea. People don't necessarily agree with me on this, but I don't usually call Eve complex. It's very dense. There's just a lot there. Like, if you look at Eve mail, it's not complex, but in the grand scheme of things, it's, it, there's just a lot more going on, what it can interact with and those types of things. So the general idea was that we'd clear the table of all of these services so that people could think a bit bigger about what they could actually build in EVE. And that is kind of the core of what our team is for. We're, we're supposed to be a force multiplier for the developers and the, more specifically, the feature teams that are building all the stuff that you guys actually do on a daily basis. Like, this is why I say cosmic plumber. If you know that it's a problem, then you don't ever think about the plumbing in your house until it's busted, right? Um, with the simulation pieces, we have some theories about that that we're very interested in testing. Uh, because when we talk about the performance piece of Quasar, that's kind of one of the, pe one of the big pieces about gRPC. Uh, when we look at fleet fights, th like we're get estimating around 30% of the performance there is spent on multiplexing serialization and transmission. Well, IOCP, because it defers it to the kernel, gets rid of a bit of that, but it doesn't because it still needs to interact with the socket. Serialization is still in Python, which is very slow. Um, and multiplexing, meaning 7,000 people in a system, one person goes bang, and there's 6,999 other messages that we need to send. What we've done with Quasar, with gRPC mechanisms in the server, is that's offloaded to a separate thread. So basically, because of the Python uh, to C++ mechanism in Protobuf that just comes stock with it, we just have to marshal memory over, and then we have a separate thread, crazy, Eve has a separate thread, to do something, where it's actually doing the serialization and the transmission, so we get it for <laughs> free. Um, and then we lean heavily on the message bus ecosystem, which is where the dynamic mechanisms come in. And there's a bigger conversation that we could have around, like, it, you'd be surprised the, the features that require the most complex routing mechanisms. One of them that highlights this is shared bookmarks. From a routing perspective, that becomes a nightmare real fast. And it's one of the few things that are actually implemented on the proxy side because it needs all of that information. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, a lot, it a lot of, I think more of it is, is it like, would it make sense for a team to say, you know what, I want to get email all into a Quasar domain server? And right. So would we, would we preemptively move things over into Quasar? Um, Yes, if there's a vehicle for it. We're, we, we're just not there to go and like, we're going to refactor everything. No one's going to sign up for that, right? Um, so it, it comes with a vehicle. Like, what are we doing? Like, for example, a lot of the work that we've done under the hood for chat to get it out of XMPP in the current state that it's in um, is that behind the scenes, we've had to build a present service, which has to know where people are in EVE at all times authoritatively which hilariously we found is very difficult. 
Um, so, but we need something to motivate those types of changes, and then we'll go back into them. Like, if, if, the, if the skills revamp starts touching on things like characters, and there's enough traffic there, we might want to pull characters into a service inside of Quasar. But that would be significant open heart surgery, right? Yes, go that way. Uh, I saw a talk uh, a few years ago, similarly titled, and uh, the speaker talked about adopting, uh, if my memory serves me, uh, Rabbit and Q. And yeah, was it a, did it have an orange bus icon in the, in the right. yeah, that was being Tuxford in Vegas, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I could ramble about this for a while, but the short version of that is basically Beam is Cube before Cube was a thing. Um, and the only difference really is kind of the API. Uh, and, and this is kind of the trend that I'm seeing in technology in general is that the implementation doesn't really matter, it's the APIs that matter. So Prometheus, for example, everyone loves the APIs for Prometheus and how to aggregate data and how to transmit remote data, those kind of things. Everyone also hates the implementation of Prometheus because it eats all the RAM. And most people don't take into consideration cardinality and those types of things. So for things like Erlang, Elixir, and Beam, like that whole ecosystem is actually quite amazing, but it's not compatible with anything current in that sense, and it also doesn't provide a good external control plane with kind of what the rest of the world is used to. I think that's the big difference. Like, we tried running, you know, uh, Beam inside of Cube, which doesn't make sense, because Beam wants to own the hardware. And then it clusters itself and all those nice things. But that it requires your whole entire ecosystem to be inside of Erlang or Elixir. And that's kind of where the success of Cube came from, because it gave, you, it gave everyone primitives to, to have that ubiquitous language to have a conversation across basically the entire globe. That's why it caught fire. So how do we, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but how do we make things go faster with Quasar? Um, ultimately, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, when we were talking about the, the effects of uh, transmission, serialization, multiplexing, those types of things. Um, what I'm trying to do and what we're toying with and, and playing with the idea of is uh, sending simulation frames over Quasar. Because we know, one, that's already significantly faster just over the wire. It's significantly faster. Theoretically, we know we can then free up 30% of the processing time during a massive fleet fight. That, that is our upper bounds of what we could potentially bring to the table, but that is a non-trivial project and literally reassembling the train as it's going down the tracks. Um, so we haven't engaged in any of this yet. And again, this comes with the clearing the table concept of like we'll, we'll keep moving things off the table, which in effect will give us some certain percentage of there's less things this, this needs to do. But in the grand scheme of things, you, at the end of the day, you still wind up with a node dedicated to JITA. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter how many services we take away at that point, there's still a node dedicated to JITA, even if it's only for the uh, simulation aspect of it. Um, so that's kind of why we're toying with the ideas behind, like, we could send simulation frames over this and, and get a 30% bump in, in how we're doing things. And there might be some other things in there, like the things that we've talked about in the past, and this is all theoretical. EVE is 100% accurate but it doesn't necessarily need to be, and I know that's a terrifying statement. Um, because when you have 7,000 people shooting that one guy, at some point in time you gotta go, he's dead. Like, stop, <laughs> stop counting the bullets, he's gone. Uh, but Eve keeps going, yep, still dead, still dead, still dead. Um, so there's, there's maybe some other like, philosophical things that we could take on like, how we deal with the rules engine and the simulation in that regard, but this is all theory crafting, because again, it comes back to the, the vehicle that we have to move forward with those things. But I am I am personally chomping at the bits to find something to hook that to that we can toy with that idea. It, it might, the first iteration of that might be something like we don't send, like the data that comes in for the gate holograms, like the state on the other side of the gate, uh, we might toy with the idea of routing that over Quasar 
like start simple there and start kind of, again, the clear the table mentality of like how far deeply can we go into that, that space. Um, you, you had a question. Yeah. Right, so what domain services have been put into Quasar? Um, so there is a chat service that we haven't rolled out yet. It's kind of a, been a shadow service. Uh, some players have already found that. <laughs> um, and uh, skill plans is another one. Activity tracker was the original one, but activity tracker is not necessarily a 100% Quasar service in the sense that uh, it smuggles data through the original Carbon IO connections uh, because it was built before we had the connectivity to the client. So we're like, ah, oh, we can consume and track all these events that are coming in, but we can't tell anybody. <laughs> so we just send it back through the server itself down to the client. That's something that we could uh, probably renovate or that will come with the changes that we're doing for the Air Career Program. Um, the Air Career Program will be another one that's 100% uh, Quasar. Uh, the one we are talking about earlier, which isn't really player facing, but the um, presence management, uh, which we normally were doing in XMPP, uh, which <laughs> Fun fact, 90% uh, of the traffic in XMPP for us is presence, not chat. Uh, it's just telling everyone where they are. Um, that's, that's the biggest multiplexing problem that we have. Um, there's probably some other ones I'm forgetting, but those are the, I think, uh, data. Oh, yeah, for the, like the data pipelines for, uh, for data and analytics. Um, do we still do the recommendation stuff? Yeah. The recommendation, like, so the recommendations that you get, the three recommendations that you get if you get into, is it still feature flagged? I can't remember. It's, it's, for, everybody. it's for everybody. So yeah, so you, those three recommendations that come in, that's actually closing the loop from the client to Quasar to the data cube, if you will, warehouse, lake, I don't know any of the data terms. Um, and then that's coming back through Quasar to the client of saying, hey, you want to do one of these three things based on what you've been doing in EVE. Uh, I think that's it. Any of my guys in here that I hear? Yeah, we'll just st stop there. Last question. That guy. Right, uh, so the question is like, if we have all these things emitting events and parts of them come down and go back up, how do we deal with integrity in that regard? So there are massive papers that you can read on that that are really boring, but event sourcing is the answer to that question. Um, a lot of how we deal with that is mostly a little bit more than best effort delivery. And what I mean by that is best effort is usually like, it's on the socket, good luck. Um, so we also have a little bit more than that where we do a lot of disk queuing and mechanisms for like publishing confirms with RabbitMQ. So we basically say, hey, RabbitMQ, send this to people and tell me when the first guy got it. Uh, and if that doesn't happen, it goes to disk and we retry. So this usually manifests in that fail state as, as a thundering herd or a stampede basically um, where I, I think we've talked about this on Twitter during certain interesting situations where it's like, yep, we're now draining 50 million events because something fell over. Um, but that's the big difference between, like I was saying earlier, with uh, the, the events in the universe that are facts, those are the ones that we treat uh, uh, with more <laughs> respect, I guess, if you will. Uh, those are the ones that we trust. If that thing comes through, it's true. Whereas the events that are coming from the client, meh, you have to be statistically significant because if it falls over, we don't care. They have different SLOs. They do, that's true. Yes, yes, they do, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. SLO is service uh, level objective. Uh, and there's also SLIs, which are indicators. And these are different from alerts in general. It, this gets into SRE stuff. But ultimately, it's more about knowing that your system is trending poorly versus something terrible has already happened. Um, but yeah, I think you said that was the last one. All right, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. We also have a roundtable after this. <laughs>